The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion. The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim As-salatu wa salamu alayka ya Rasulallah wa ala alika wa ashabika ya Habiballah As-salatu wa salamu alayka ya Nabiyallah wa ala alika wa ashabika ya Nurallah Welcome to another session of our program The Clear Criterion Today, inshallah, we will look at the tafsir or the exegesis, the commentary of Surah Al-Fatiha. We will try to cover at least some of this surah today in today's episode. Before I do that, I would like to share with you some points or a very important reminder regarding the excellence of sending blessings in favor of the Prophet ﷺ. Our Prophet ﷺ told us, that if we adorn our gatherings, he actually said, adorn your gatherings by sending blessings upon me, for this action will be light, nur for you on the day of judgment. So let us beautify our gatherings by sending, invoking blessings in favor of our beloved Prophet, the best in creation, mercy for all the worlds, Al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Let our love for him be expressed through this prayer that we express again and again. Whenever we have time, whenever we have a moment to ourselves, let us devote some moments to the Prophet ﷺ in terms of expressing a prayer of blessings for him. We say Durud Sharif or Salat ala Nabi. And this, inshallah, with Allah's grace, with the mercy of Allah subhanahu ta'ala, we hope for purification, purification of the heart, that through this noble deed, Allah subhanahu ta'ala, we hope and pray, accepts us as those among those who love his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And through this love, may we attain salvation in the hereafter. Sallu ala al-Habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad. In our previous episode, we looked at the meaning of the word Qur'an. We looked at some aspects to do with um, exegesis in terms of the timeline, how tafsir came about, meaning the books of tafsir. Before that, who was clarifying the verses of the Qur'an? And we were reminded that ultimately the exegesis comes from Allah subhanahu ta'ala and his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then this whole sequence of uh, this development phase of commentary of the Qur'an after the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and the followers, the tabi'un, and then the scholars who came after them, how they worked so hard, their endeavors. We enjoy the fruits of their endeavors. The books that we benefit from today are due to the efforts of our pious scholarly pious predecessors rahimahumullah ta'ala today inshallah we begin this um, session or we begin this phase of tafsir or exegesis with surah al-fatiha surah al-fatiha when we translate it a fatiha can be translated or usually is understood as the opening and surah al-fatiha is in terms of sequence the very first surah of the Qur'an, not the very first to be revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wasallam, but in the sequence that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Wasallam taught his companions, it is the first surah. It has a great significance. Many specific narrations about Surah Al-Fatiha, we will write, inshallah, we will cover some of the points related to it. In terms of revelation, in terms of when Surah Al-Fatiha was revealed, um, the majority of ulama say it was revealed in Makkah al-Mukarrama, but some scholars say that it was revealed in Medina al-Munawwara. And there is also an opinion that it was revealed twice in Makkah al-Mukarrama and in Medina al-Munawwara. Zadhumullahu sharafu wa ta'zima in terms of the formation or the surah itself. It consists of obviously one ruku in terms of the way we look at that uh, particular part. 
of uh, the Quran, so Surah Al-Fatiha is considered to be one ruku, consisting of seven verses, 27 words, and 140 letters in terms of the calculation that is recorded by the ulama. Surah Al-Fatiha has uh, many names and it is commonly uh, quoted in the books of the ulama that having something, anything that has many names usually alludes to its significance and importance. And I would like to share with you some of the names of Surah Al-Fatiha and explain uh, where required what these names mean or the, the connection they have with Surah Al-Fatiha. Obviously it's called Fatiha Al-Kitab because it's the opening of the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So this is one term which is mentioned as the Quran begins with this very Surah. It's called Fatiha Al-Kitab. It's also because it begins with Alhamdulillah. It is also called Surah Al-Hamd. And it is also called Ummul Quran or Ummul Kitab. Now, when Ummul Quran or Ummul Kitab is mentioned, it is in the sense of the essence. Um here does not necessarily, does not mean mother, but it's usually used in this way to mean that it is one of the most important aspects of something or the essence of something. It's also referred to as as Sab'ul Masani because. Sab'a here meaning uh, the seven, the seven verses. Mathani, the indication being that it's repeated often. Because these verses are repeated more than once or uh, repeated often, it's referred to these verses of Surah Al-Fatiha or Surah Al-Fatiha itself is called as al Mathani. This was a term used by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. We'll come to that shortly. Some other terms that we know, Surah Al-Kanz, Surah Al-Wafiya, Surah Al-Kafiya. There is also a healing in the Quran and specifically Surah Al-Fatiha. It is known for its effect in terms of healing. And for this reason, which name do you think it has? Yes, Surah Al-Shifa. It is a shifa, a cure, a healing. It's also called Surah Al-Shafiya in the same context. The surah itself is also a supplication when we look at the themes, which we will do uh, after these names. The surah itself is, can be described as a dua or a supplication, and hence it is also called surah to dua, surah to ta'lim al masala, surah to suwal, surah to munajat, and surah to tafweed. So, we, from these names, different names of surah al fatiha, we are given an understanding of or some insight into the importance of this surah and how it has different points of excellence related to it. And moving on to points of excellence, I would like to first share with you an account of a companion where the Prophet ﷺ told him about the excellence of Surah Al-Fatiha. The account involves Sayyidina Abu Sa'id bin Mu'alla who was praying in the masjid and the Prophet ﷺ called out to him. But as he was in prayer, he didn't answer the Prophet ﷺ. So when he finished praying, he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he explained that, O oh, Messenger of Allah ﷺ, I was uh, engaged in prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ taught him a very important principle. He quoted, he said to him, that has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not said, Istajibu lillahi wa lirrasooli ila da'akum. Meaning, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not commanded in the Quran that when Allah and His Messenger called, summon you, you should attend, you should become present, you should uh, leave what you're doing basically and, and um, come to um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So the ruling that He was teaching His companion was that. The importance of me summoning you is that even if you're praying, Allah has instructed this. And when the Prophet summons you, you leave your prayer and you come and attend and listen to what the Prophet ﷺ has to say, which it highlights the importance of the beloved Messenger ﷺ. So coming back to this point, after the Prophet ﷺ told him or reminded him of this principle, he then said to him that, shall I not tell you 
about before uh, before you leave the masjid, before you leave this area, before you leave the masjid, shall I not tell you about, or shall I not teach you the most excellent or the greatest surah of the Quran? So he, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this to him, and obviously this caught his attention. Sayyidina Abu Sa'id, um, he, he noted this, and then he said that when the Prophet ﷺ held his hand, and as he was about to leave the masjid, he reminded the Prophet ﷺ, and he said that you were going to te teach me or tell me about the greatest uh, surah of the Quran, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam, and that's when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed him that the, the surah is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, meaning the Asabul Masani, the Surah Al Fatiha. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam revealed to him that the greatest surah of the Quran was Surah Al Fatiha on this occasion. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma reports that once an angel descended and addressed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam saying, Ya Rasulallah, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I bring you glad tidings of two lights that no Prophet before you was granted. No one before you, no other Prophet was given these two lights. And he revealed them. The first one was Surah Al-Fatiha and the other one, the second one was he said the last verses of Surah Baqarah. So this was specifically mentioned by this angel. Sayyidina Ubayj ibn Ka'ab radiallahu an, he reports that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu ta'ala did not reveal a surah, a chapter like Ummul Quran, meaning Surah Al-Fatiha. Allah did not reveal a surah like Ummul Quran in the Torah or the Injil, meaning in the Torah or the Gospel. So in the previous books, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal a surah like Surah Al-Fatiha. This, um, this was declared by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. How fortunate we are that not only do we have this surah, it is part of our daily routine of prayer. We uh, recite these verses of Surah Al-Fatiha a number of times every single day as part of worship, which is obligatory upon us. And one other point that I would like to mention, the Prophet Sallallahu is reported to have said that in Surah Al-Fatiha, there is the cure for every illness. And hence the Sahaba Radiallahu Ta'ala and whom in traditional reports and our pious predecessors after them, they would often, as a ruqya, recite Surah Al-Fatiha and blow onto uh, someone if they were in an ailing condition or suffering from any condition. So the first hadith that I mentioned regarding the excellence of Surah Al-Fatiha involving Sayyiduna Abu Sa'id bin Mu'alla was from Bukhari. The second hadith that I mentioned was from Muslim. And the third hadith which I mentioned about Ummul Quran being unique that a surah like this is not found in the, the Torah or the Injil, in, in the Gospel. This was from Tirmidhi. As far as the themes of the surah are concerned, what is Surah Al-Fatiha about? It begins with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It declares how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord. He is uh, the infinitely gracious and the most merciful. The words in Arabic use Rahman and Rahim. So Allah introduces himself as Rahman and Rahim. It also mentions uh, the resurrection about the day of recompense or the day of judgment. And that is the theme of resurrection. The surah also mentions that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of worship and ultimately all help comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He in reality is the source of all help. We will explain this if we get to that verse today. And another main theme which we mentioned as we're going through the names of Surah Al-Fatiha is Dua. This is a supplication because within the Surah itself, the expressions towards the end of the Surah are expressions of supplication, of guidance, and supplications of um, following the way of those who are favored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before we look at uh, the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha or some of its verses in the time that we have left, um, in terms of uh, legislative matters, Surah Al-Fatiha, to recite it as part of the prayer is necessary, it's wajib, 
if uh, for an imam and one who is reciting on his own, as far as someone who is following the imam, then such a person who is praying in congregation, he is to remain silent, whether it is a prayer in which the recitation is allowed or the recitation is not allowed. So the the one who prays in congregation behind the imam, he is not to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. This is the Hanafi position of fiqh or in terms of Islamic law. And it's based upon the verse of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْسِتُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us that when the Qur'an is recited, we should listen to it attentively and we should become silent that we may receive the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a hadith mentioned in Ibn Majah reported by Sayyidina Abu Musa Ash'ari where he reported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when the Imam recites, you remain silent, meaning those who are behind the Imam. And there's also a hadith in Ibn Majah reported by Sayyidina Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whosoever has an imam, meaning who the one who prays behind an imam, then the recitation of the imam is the recitation of the follower. In light of this, there is an account of Imam Abu Hanifa, a very interesting story of Imam Abu Hanifa, where he was approached by some scholars of Medina al Munawwara who wanted to debate um, this subject about uh, whether or not the person in attendance in the jama'ah in congregation prayer, whether or not he should recite Surah Al-Fatiha as well as the Imam. So obviously Imam Abu Hanifa's position being that when the Imam is reciting or when you're behind an Imam, then Surah Al-Fatiha is not recited. Uh, the person praying behind the Imam remains silent. So they wanted to debate this issue. Imam Abu Hanifa said to them, just summarizing the account, he said to them, I can't uh, discuss with all of you, so why don't one person is appointed among you and then I can discuss with him? So they decided to do that and the Imam, he asked them, he said, is this individual that you have appointed, is he the most knowledgeable among you? They said, yes. Imam Abu Hanifa asked them that if I debate with him, will that be equal to me debating with the rest of you? Meaning that will you accept uh, his representation for all of you in this debate or discussion? Again, they said yes. Imam Abu Hanifa then asked them that if I establish an evidence against him, will this be established against you? Obviously, they said yes again. Then the Imam said, if I win through evidence and through discussion of discussion, if I win, and uh, I have the upper hand and the evidence that I present becomes binding, then will this be the case? Will this be binding upon you too? Obviously, the group of scholars, they said yes. And the Imam said, how is that the case? If I debate your representative and the evidence that I bring, it gives me the upper hand and it becomes binding on him. How, how does it become binding on you? The other scholars, they replied by saying it's because he is our representative and we have made him our imam, our leader in this discussion. Uh, imam Hanifa then responded by saying to them, we say the very same thing. This is what we say about the prayer, that we appoint an individual as an imam whose recitation is our recitation because he is our representative. And when they heard this explanation from the Imam, they accepted it. That it made sense to them that just as they had chosen the one who had the most knowledge or who was the most eligible in their eyes to be their representative, Imam Abu Hanifa explained that that's the essence of the concept when an Imam of the prayer leads and the others are praying behind him. That, that was just an interesting account to about the subject of Surah Al-Fatiha being recited in prayer. We begin with Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the infinitely gracious, the most merciful. Surah Al-Fatiha, um, in this discussion, we obviously begin with Bismillah rahman rahim What is the significance of Bismillah rahman rahim in terms of Qur'an? It's itself is a verse of the Qur'an. 
and we will discuss some of the points related to Bismillah Rahman Rahim shortly. But Bismillah Rahman Rahim, when it comes before each surah, it's not counted as another verse before each surah. It is it is a verse on its own of the Quran, but it comes before the different chapters of the Quran to make that difference clear that a chapter has just ended and a new one has just begun. Imam Fakhruddin Razi, he mentions that Allah subhanahu ta'ala describes himself as Ar-Rahman, the infinitely gracious, Ar-Rahim, the most merciful. So it is far-fetched that he would not bestow mercy upon his chosen creation. So this is the way Allah subhanahu ta'ala introduces himself. These attributes are the very first attributes that he mentions. As far as the some of the rulings are concerned, as I have just mentioned, uh, when Bismillah comes before every surah, it's uh, still considered to be one verse of the Qur'an and it's just there for separation. In Surah Naml, verse 30, it is part of that verse. It is not considered to be separate. Second thing uh, to mention here is that, or a second point to mention here is, the ulama encourage that in the Taraweeh prayer, at least uh, once, Bismillah rahman rahim is recited aloud at some point in recitation to fulfill that uh, element of uh, the Quran. And when the last point that I'd like to mention here is that if one is reciting Surah Tawbah, if you begin your recitation with Surah Tawbah, which doesn't have Bismillah written before it, then uh, one can read A'udhu Billah, Ta'awudh and Bismillah. Uh, before reciting, but if it comes, Surah Tawbah comes in re during recitation, you were reciting the, the Surah before or the, some verses before it, and then Surah Tawbah was to come, we don't read Bismillah rahman rahim before it. It's only when we begin recitation with that particular Surah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praises for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, meaning Allah subhanahu ta'ala is worthy of every praise. Hamd is the praise of Allah subhanahu ta'ala or hamd means the, the praise of one due to his personal attributes of excellence. And shukr is when one expresses reverence to another due to a favor bestowed upon him through his tongue, through his heart or through his limbs. A reverence in response to a favor that is shukr and hamd in essence is to praise one due to his personal qualities or attributes of excellence. For Allah subhanahu ta'ala, both hamd and shukr become synonymous because we praise Allah subhanahu ta'ala due to his personal excellent attributes not given to him subhanahu ta'ala. They are his without anyone giving them to him. He is Allah subhanahu ta'ala who possesses excellence. And at the same time, we receive blessings and favors from Allah subhanahu ta'ala. So our feeling of reverence and gratitude is in response to the countless and immeasurable favors that we receive from Allah subhanahu ta'ala. Sayyiduna Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and who reports, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the best form of dhikr is la ilaha illallah and the best supplication is Alhamdulillah. And Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who also reports that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when Allah subhanahu ta'ala bestows a blessing upon his servant and on receiving it, the servant or the individual responds by saying Alhamdulillah, then this hamd, this praise of Allah subhanahu ta'ala is greater in the court of Allah subhanahu ta'ala than the blessing that was given. Meaning Allah subhanahu ta'ala values that praise more than the blessing that he gave the individual. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Lillah for Allah subhanahu ta'ala. All praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this aspect, in terms of the commentary, Allah, the name Allah, what does this mean or what meanings, which meanings have the ulama mentioned in their books? Allah subhanahu ta'ala is the possessor 
of all excellent qualities. All excellent qualities are found in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Allah. Every excellent attribute is part of the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of what the scholars have mentioned in tafsir or exegesis, some meanings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are mentioned. One meaning is that Allah refers to one who is worthy of worship. So Allah means one who is worthy of worship, refers to the entity, the being who is worthy of worship. The second meaning that is given is Allah refers to an entity about whom intellects are in astonishment, meaning the minds are in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether this is understood in the meaning of they do not understand the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they are just generally in a state of astonishment. So Allah is the, the one in response to whom others, people of intelligence, they are just in a state of astonishment. And a third meaning that is mentioned is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the entity from whom one attains satisfaction. In his court, there is satisfaction. Allah mentions in the Quran that in his remembrance, there is the satisfaction of hearts. So the one from whom satisfaction, contentment is attained is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is attained from his court. It, the source of contentment is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fourth or a fourth meaning that is mentioned is the entity from whom protection is sought against calamity. So when someone is in distress or facing calamity, the one from whom protection is sought is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so Allah means the one from whom protection is sought in a state of distress or calamity. The whole verse being Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. He is Lord of all the worlds. The word Rabb can mean leader, it can mean master, it can mean one who is worthy of worship. It can mean one who... Uh, who enables another to attain excellence sequentially. A number of meanings for Rabb, sustainer. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbul Alameen because He is declaring that Alam is everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is Lord of all of that. So Allah is Rabb and the Alam is everything other than Him. And he is Lord and Master of all of that. We conclude with this point and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the little that we have covered regarding the Quran and some points related to Surah Al-Fatiha, these points are a means of inspiration for us. We will continue and hopefully complete the exegesis or the intended exegesis of this surah in our next episode. And I say intended exegesis because in reality, as I mentioned previously, Sayyidina Ali, he said he could fill or load 70 camels, just explaining Surah Al-Fatiha. We are not going to do something like that. And uh, in fact, we do not have the capability to do that. But the purpose of these sessions is to have a balance where we look at the meanings of the Quran, the meanings of the verses, we give some background, but also we cover as many verses as we can to create a balance between uh, quantity and um, clarity as well. Inshallah, this is our intention and we pray Allah accepts our efforts. Keep watching Madani channel. Sallu ala al-Habib. Sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad. The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion. The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion.